Today on What It's Like, we get to talk Genesis for an iconic Lincoln brand, the original Continental. But before getting into all of it, I'm Jay. Welcome to What It's Like. We dive in deep with the lost and forgotten classics, vintage, some exotics, so much more than walking around a car with music. Each episode is presented in such a way that you're in the market to buy these cars. If that sounds like a channel that you'll totally dig, subscribe and hit the bell icon next to it to never miss a video. If you're in the market for a first generation Lincoln Continental, you're in luck. This is currently for sale at Classic Auto Mall. For more information, pricing, and pictures, be sure to click the link below after the show. For those that never made it to the end of an episode, there is Name That Tune at the end of each episode and also scenes to our next episode. Let's talk Lincoln. Lincoln was an independent brand unaffiliated with the Ford Motor Company in the very beginning, and they produced high-end cars. It was founded in August of 1917 by Henry Leland and son, Wilfred. If their names ring a bell, that is because they owned Cadillac and sold it to GM in 1909, which ironically was the remnants of the Henry Ford Motor Company, which was the second auto company in the USA after the Detroit Automobile Company. Leland chose to name his new auto company after the 16th president of the United States, the first president he ever voted for, so he named it the Lincoln Motor Car Company. Fast forward a couple years to 1922, Lincoln Motor Car Company was hemorrhaging money big time. Edsel Ford, son of Henry Ford, was like, Dad, we should totally buy the Lincoln Motor Car Company. Think about it. You lost your first company to this guy. Granted, it's not the same company as you started, but... It's a way for you to get even with Leland. And with that, Henry Ford would buy the Lincoln Motor Car Company for $8 million on February 4th, 1922. And in a way, came full circle. And get this, you could say whatever you want about Henry Ford, but Henry Leland and Wilford were invited to stay at the company with Edsel at the helm. But just like after the Cadillac purchase, Leland and son didn't stay around long after. They left after a dispute a couple months later. Fast forward to 1941. The Lincoln was offered in three models. Zephyr, Continental, Custom Limo Series. The Continental was all new car that was offered by Lincoln. And for 1940, it was technically under Zephyr. 1941, the Continental became its own. Eugene T. Bob Gregory, he started with Zephyr lines, lowered the body and roof line, which made the car look more streamlined. The very first Continental was built for Edsel Ford in 1939. The prototype car was essentially a channeled and sectioned Lincoln Zephyr. The prototype sat seven inches lower than the Zephyr, giving the Continental a streamlined design. The production car was essentially the Lincoln Zephyr and technically part of the Zephyr line, not branching out as its own individual model until 1941. It sat three inches lower than the Zephyr and the hood was seven inches longer. It used a dash from the town limo. Lincoln would go on to offer the Continental from 1939 to 2020 with break periods in between in 10 generations. 1941 is Genesis, first generation, which had a production run from 1940 through 1942, took a break for World War II, 46 through 48, 40, 41, 42, 46, 47, 48. Could be had as a two-door coupe or a two-door cabriolet. Let's talk specs. 209.8 inches long, 75 inches wide, 62 inches tall. It rides a wheelbase of 125 inches. It weighs 4,300 pounds. Price, $2,778, which is equivalent to you spending $56,310.58 in the year 2023. Total, 1941 Lincoln production was 17,756 units of which total Continentals was 1,251 units. Total Cabriolets were 400 and total Coupes was 850 units. Only one engine on offer, and it's important to note that they offered this in the Zephyr as well as the Continental. 292 cubic inch displacement V12, 4.8 liters. It's good for 120 brake horsepower, 3,500 RPM, 220 pound-feet of torque at 2,000 RPM. With a bore of 2.9 inches and a stroke of 3.8 inches, compression is 7.2 to 1. Has four main bearings, features hydraulic lifters, has aluminum heads as well as manifolds. Let's talk styling. This car is absolutely gorgeous. Look at how this just bees 
right into the nose here and it's really pronounced nice v12 badge there hood ornament just look at how swooping these are if you look at it from here it almost looks like a butterfly doesn't it that's nuts I love the color differentiation between these lines like they painted these lines to separate the chrome a little bit super nice also check out this grill section how it's all split headlights the headlights look like they're Ford headlights and Lincoln just borrowed them marker lights and or parking lights up here take a look at that shape from the top down coming around the side here check out these fenders and how they bulge out and then how they swoop back inside here like look at how extreme that is check out the mirror placement look how it's bent comes back up around I absolutely love this fender design and how how aggressively it bows out and then it comes back in the body also has kind of a bow to it as well like if you look at it from this angle down here how it comes back out to come over this rear fender it's got gravel guards here feels like just like a rubber mat almost Coming back to the rear end section, gas filler caps right there. Look at how this fender tapers back into the body back here. Trunk section, spare tire, which is encased in this case. I like how it says link in there with the uh, center light. Getting in the trunk section. trunk is massive I never knew that these things were this huge that's a full-size spare tire there and it goes way way back so check out those little hinges it does have a key cylinder so it can be locked Coming up and getting inside, notice there isn't a door handle, it's a button and it's spring loaded. So when I push the button it springs out at me. So watch this, I'm going to push the button and it did that all on its own. But just take a look at this door panel, door lock is right here. And notice it doesn't have a door handle to get out it has a button just like uh, just like the door handle to get in this is the door handle to pull the door shut armrest this operates the vent window and it operates like that this operates the big window trimmed out here's a look at the interior the pedal box down here notice there is a hood release inside there's a handbrake clutch brake gas pedal as well as high beam dimmer switches on the floor right there so somebody in the comment section was telling me to see if the seats are adjustable i don't see an adjustment spot for these seats i looked over here and i looked underneath here and I don't see an adjustment. So these seats aren't adjustable. So that's what the door sounds like shutting. Here's what over the hood looks like. Here's what first person and over the hood looks like. Adequate space underneath the steering wheel. Um, and the only reason I show this is because if you don't fit in the car, you can't drive it. The steering wheels on these cars are huge and generally you can't move the steering wheel and sometimes the car seats don't move so that's why i show this i wear size 34 pants 
So if you were the same size as me, you'll fit in here no problem at all. If you're bigger than me, it looks like there's, there's probably two, maybe three inches underneath the steering wheel. On to the button switches and knobs. There is a lot going on in this dashboard. Starting on the left and moving right, wipers, power top, starter button. The one labeled L is for the headlights. The one labeled S is for the heater. Heater control is right next to it. The one labeled D is for defroster. Overdrive is right below it. Two gauge pods sit directly in front of the driver. The first pod has just about everything in it. Oil pressure at the top, amp meter, coolant temperature, gasoline gauge, speedometer is in the right pod. Odometer at the top, tripometer at the bottom. There are three small lights right next to that. The first one is for the left turn signal indicator. The center one is high beam switch, right turn signal indicator, clock, ignition, hand throttle, choke, lighter, Radio with radio controls. I found this very useful diagram. If you missed anything, it says 1941, but it goes for the 1940 as well. Up above, there are sun visors. They're a bit on the slender side, but um, they're nice. I, I like them. They, they work a lot like the way the Cadillacs work, the 36 Cadillac. Over here, there's a nice petite rear view mirror, but you can see out the rear view mirror pretty good. Passenger side sun visor. Also, look at how the top works. They look like little suit latches for a suitcase. That's pretty cool. This is what I look like behind the wheel of this Lincoln. I got tons of headspace, and if I didn't, the top comes off and the sky is literally the limit. Tons of space in this car. It's very comfortable. Look, look at that hood. Look at how long that is. It feels so classy. The steering wheel is so big, but it's so nice. On to the glove box test. Here is our test subject. Here is my hand for reference. Here is our glove box in question. Uh, it doesn't fit. It's just a wee bit smaller. It would fit in there. But it is a pretty big size glove box, all things considered. This has the cowl air vent. It's right here. It's off to the side. It's kind of weird, but look at it. It's huge. In the back seat, you just flip the seat forward like that. That's how much space you would have to get back there. So here is what the front looks like from the back. Here's a better look at the greenhouse. There is lots of space back here behind the rear seat. Knee situation. I have negative knee space. This seat is sitting up higher than the seat in the front, which is kind of weird. Just ever so slightly higher. Ashtray as well as armrest. This is what I look like sitting in the back seat. There isn't a whole lot of room before this bar. I feel like if I was bouncing around, the bar might hit my head, but I got a fro, so that's protecting my precious brain from getting uh, damaged. Back here is more or less for kids or children. I'm six foot two and I don't fit back here. It's, it's a nice seat though. The seat material, whatever it is, I think it's leather. It's, it's nice. It's a nice quality feeling material. Take a look at the top beautiful car like look at that view that you have back here getting underneath the hood the hood release is right here so that unleases the hood then you come up here and there isn't a secondary catch just lift the hood up like that notice the horns are mounted to the hood those are some big horns this one's been retrofitted with a 239 flathead V8, but what should be in here is a V12. That's what the uh, flathead 239 flathead Ford V8 looks like. It's 
It's got generator up on top. It looks like it's been converted to 12 volt, judging by the battery over there. Oil filter. On to the pros and cons. I'm getting all of these pros and cons from the complete book of collectible cars, Blue Chip Auto Investment, 70 years from 1930 to 2000 by Richard M. Langworth and the auto editors of Consumer Guide on the positive side. Ageless Design, a highly coveted CCA classic. Against it, questionable mechanical reliability, high running costs, not cheap, and quite rare. All right, now it's time for Name That Tune. First person to give me both the correct name of the band as well as song title, both correct. First one to do so will have their comment pinned to the top of the comment section. <laughs> If you'd like to get in touch with me, shoot me a comment in the comment section below or check out our Facebook group that correlates with this YouTube channel. If you're interested, the link will be in the description. So if I catch you on there or on here, just know that I appreciate all of the support. And until next time, wait a second, here are some scenes to our next episode. 1962 Studebaker Lark Daytona. This car was one of those cars that I always thought was very eh. But after being in one and touring this one, it's totally changed my mind. That's what's coming up next on what it's like. And until then, toodaloo! Oh, whoa, whoa, Lois, this is not my Batman glass.